From Microbe TV, this is Office Hours for November 15th, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and welcome to our little corner of the virology internet. Joining me tonight from Rockefeller University, Paul Binash. Welcome to Office Hours, Paul. Wow. Thank you very much, Vincent. It's a great pleasure to be with you. You have a great uh, background. Paul's in his office at Rockefeller University, and um, I've been there, and it looks over the East River. It's it's just a spectacular view. You can see all the boats going by, right, Paul? <laughs> yes, you can, although I've got the blinds down at the moment, uh, and obviously it's pretty dark outside. But yes, you can see all kinds of boats, some pretty, uh, pretty um, um, swish yachts go by from time to time. But yeah, it's a great so, office. So Paul um, is a professor at Rockefeller University and has worked on viruses his career. In fact, he was on... Um, I guess you've you've been on a couple of COVID twibs, but you also were on one where we explored your uh, your your history, right? Uh, and yeah. So um, he he has worked in the beginning of his career at, on HIV one, and now of course with COVID he switched to SARS CoV two. So get your questions queued up. Um, he has done a lot yeah. on antigenic variation of SARS CoV two. And um, well, we can ask him anything about COVID. Don't be shy. <clears throat> yeah, you can even. I you should can even say ask though. What... Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I have. I have. We haven't abandoned the HIV work. Uh, as the pandemic su subsided, we've uh, we've brought that right. side of the lab back. So oh, we good. Do, we're we're doing a mixture of things now. Great. Well, maybe we can. If folks have questions, ask them as well. Let me first um, welcome everyone to uh, office hours i want to thank our moderators for being here tonight we have vanity nutrition we have less uh, we have tom tom's coming in for the oregon coast and i believe that's it for tonight so folks while we're <clears throat> getting started here uh, i have to say this i have this light in front of me and there are one two three four five huge flies on it and I don't know why. I'm going to try and kill some of them. Hang on a bit because I just can't handle them being there. Ah. <laughs> it's terrible. There must be dying something down here. Um, oh, dear. Before, before uh, we get started here, folks, tell Paul, let Paul know where you're from because it's always fun <clears throat> to hear that. I know that. Uh, so, so Margot is from Arizona, 78 degrees. Yeah, Tona is from Long Island. Patricia is from Cape Cod. And here we go. Will is from China. Ah, so it's tomorrow in China right now. It's yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, Carol is from Southern California. Carol is our favorite nephrologist. You have any kidney mm -hmm. questions? You can ask Carol. Visto is from Sydney, Australia. John is from... Minneapolis. Uh, Peter is in Boulder, Colorado. <laughs> I love it. I love hearing where people are from. Um, Kathleen is from South Jersey. Nifty Fifties is from South Central Pennsylvania. Markle is from the end of Long Island. Ooh, Abdul Aziz is from Saudi Arabia. <clears throat> wow. PGL is from Massachusetts. Rima is from Iowa. Les is from California. Elizabeth, West Virginia. Lori Tomball, Texas. Airy Ozone, Asheville, North Carolina. Michigan. Ecuador. Wow. Toledo, Ohio. Cincinnati, Ontario. New, New South Wales, Australia. And Silver Spring, just down the street from, I'm betting you're going to say Amy, because I think she, that's where the FDA is. Oh, my God. Now I have six flies. Let me, let me, try. <laughs> let me see if I can get some more. Uh, so that, that's quite a, quite a mix. Some U.S. Mm -hmm. and some, I guess, 
other side of the world. I guess this isn't a good time for Europeans, right? They'll be in. Well, we have a few. Yeah. We have we have uh, Weymouth, UK. Okay. Ah, <clears throat> well, it's really middle of the night there. A lot of people come from Europe, and it is the middle of the night, but they yeah. uh, they want to uh, know about it. Okay. Um, we we off, we have a moderator from New Zealand, but he's not in tonight. Mm -hmm. Lynn is from Ontario. <clears throat> Hold on a second here. I think I'm fighting a losing battle against these flies, so I might as well give up and just deal with them flying around. Uh, all right, so that's our crew so far. There'll be more people here tonight. Um, <laughs> principles of virology as fly control. Actually, it's not. <clears throat> so actually, I shouldn't be using this. This is a printout of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, <laughs> which was given to me by Laura Splan, who's a, who's an artist in Brooklyn. And in fact, you know, it's, it's, she sells these things and here I am using it <laughs> to kill flies. That's pretty funny. I have killed a few, but um, they're um, outlasting me. Yeah. Uh, and we got, uh, I don't know where he's from, but, uh, Hat is from L.A. You know, anywhere you are. Farm D. Hello, Kip and Laura from from San Francisco. Mm hmm Huh. All right. Where, where are you originally from, uh, Paul? I'm actually from the eastern part of England. I was born in Norwich, East Anglia. <clears throat> very, very flat, very rural. Nothing much happens there except uh, farming and airfields. <laughs> East Anglia, okay. Yeah, we have we have. I, I could only see one person from the UK here, um, but tonight usually there are more. Usually, so we have Barb Mack, UK, who's a moderator, uh -huh. but she's not here tonight. Yeah, Europe, it's tough because it's um, it's pretty yeah. late. So it's eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, one, two a.m. Right? Yeah, and it'll be pretty pretty cold there now. I would think. Yeah. People don't want to uh, be coming here. Yeah. All right, so let's start um, by having you tell us your story, Paul. So you're from uh, England there, and, and um, where did you go to? Where did you go to college, and what did you do there? So, um, as an undergrad, I went to the University of Bath, which is sort of on the west side of England. Um, I, I. Um, didn't really know what I wanted to do when I started in college. Uh, actually, science was very much a second choice career for me. Uh, I have a family that has a history of being in the Air Force. Both my both my grandfathers, my father were both uh, both in the Royal, all in the Royal Air Force, and that's that's really what I wanted to do. But it turns out if you can't see well, they won't let you fly planes. <laughs> no, not in the Air Force. So, so I had to find something else to do. And I, I found in the latter part of my high school days that I, I enjoyed chemistry, but it has sort of an internal logic to it, which attracted me, but it's also a little dry. So when I went to college, um, to add just a little flavor to it, I, I studied biochemistry as my major. In the UK, you, you are um, implored to um, to specialize, I think a little earlier than, than is normal in the United States. So, mm. so we don't, didn't really do any humanities or anything at college. It was very much science based and <laughs> the Krebs cycle and all that exciting stuff. Um, in the sort of latter part of my undergraduate degree though, um, things like molecular genetics were just becoming, um, sort of available to a broader range of people. Um, this would be in the sort of early, early to mid eighties. And, uh, yeah, that, that, that was the revolution that was coming. Mm. I have to take a picture of these damn flies. <laughs> it's just, nobody's going to believe it. As, so, um, <clears throat> you, you actually, you got a PhD in the UK as well, right? Yeah. <clears throat> So, um, so the, my, 
my undergraduate degree in the early 80s sort of coincided with um, the arrival of HIV as a big biomedical problem. Um, that, that created qu quite a lot of opportunities for young scientists to become mm. virologists. Um, I was the sort of person who could have gotten interested, and I think, in just about any aspect of biological yeah. science, but it's just statistically the, the, the number of opportunities to be a virologist were, were quite great at that time. And so I, I did a PhD at Imperial College in London with uh, Jonathan Weber initially and then Myra McClure, who your longtime mm. listeners will remember from the XMRV uh, yeah. episodes of a few years ago. She, um, she's, she's was a, you know, has been a retrovirologist for many years, recently retired, in fact, but she was really? my, yeah. she was my mentor uh, as a, as a PhD student, where I studied um, foamy viruses, which I wonder actually whether your listeners would have heard of foamy viruses. They are, they're very understudied. There's just a handful of people in the world study these viruses. They are, they're retroviruses. They are um, nearly ubiquitous uh, in mammals. Um, essentially all primate species uh, except mm -hmm. humans carry them. They're extremely cytopathic in cell culture. They tear cells apart. But as far as we can tell, don't cause a single animal to ever get sick. What, what animal is that? Uh, primates, primates, hamsters, right, yeah. sea lions, mm. a whole range of mammals. I bet if you looked hard enough, you could find them in greater than 50% of mammalian species. Now, they're but not, not humans unless they've been bitten right. by monkeys. Now, famously, Maxine Lineal worked on foamy viruses, right? Absolutely. Yes, she was. Yeah. Uh, she was one of one of one of the handful of us that were working on foamy viruses. Now, if I if I remember from my virology lectures, is it correct to, that they 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 package DNA in the particle? Is that correct? That is correct. Um, and gosh, I'm not sure if I'm a middle author on one of the papers showing that. Actually, our collaborator Axel right. Rethwell. And Maxine, I think, found that around the same time. Mm -hmm. um, yes, they, they are, in a sense, almost evolutionary intermediates between the, the bona fide retroviruses right. that package RNA and convert it to DNA when they infect a new cell, right. and the hepadenoviruses that do cycles of reverse transcription, RNA to DNA back to RNA within a single cell. The foamy viruses, they grab RNA and sort of convert most of it to DNA as they're leaving mm. the cell. So they, they do a reverse transcription cycle. It's just the reverse transcription is earlier, in a sense, in the life cycle than a, right. than a conventional retrovirus. It's just like the hepatitis B viruses. They do a similar thing, right? Right. But they don't, they don't have to leave the cell and they don't mm. integra integrate. Foamy viruses, right. like conventional retroviruses, take their DNA and insert it into the chromosomes of a, a target cell. So do we, do we understand why reverse transcription commences immediately for foamy viruses, but not for non-foamy <coughs> retroviruses? No. We, we don't have a, a good understanding of the molecular, uh, the molecular biology of how that's, that's regulated. Um, we know for the conventional uh, retroviruses that you, you have to cut the enzyme out of a precursor for okay. it to become active. And that only happens once the particles left the cell. So inevitably, that, <clears throat> must, that must happen before the particles left the cell in the case of the foamy viruses. But no one's ever managed to tweak a conventional virus to make it reverse transcribe in a virus producing cell and then um, yeah. subvert the extracellular phase before you reverse transcribe. Here, I want to show you the flies on my, my light. Oh. <laughs> so this is, a, this is the light that is illuminating me. Look at them all. 
I mean, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. I don't know where they're coming from because I killed about a dozen. <clears throat> it's kind of scary. It's kind of like in the in the movie The Birds, when the birds are sitting on the wires, and then all of a sudden they go attack people. I'm waiting for these flies to attack me. So, oh dear. hopefully I don't Did get someone leave just, a window. Did someone leave window. a window open? Are no, they coming no. from outside or? No, I think um, I, I really, I have never seen this before and they are eerily quiet. And they, you know how flies rub their f front whatever together? They're sitting uh -huh. on the light just rubbing like we're going to attack this guy soon. Oh my God, it's so scary. Anyway, by I the way, I wanted to fly in front of the camera. Yeah, you're going to see them fly in front of me all night. This is so weird. Um, <laughs> I, want, I want to welcome Steph who's our other moderator from San Francisco. Uh, actually, we do have a foamy virus question here. Let me see if I can. <laughs> You're going to see them flying by me all night. Because unless I take a few minutes to kill them, it isn't going to happen. So where is that foamy virus question? It was just here. Uh, yeah, Paging Jeff Goldblum. Yeah, right. <laughs> like the movie fly are you exhaling so much carbon monoxide that the flies think you are fruit no they're sitting on the light they're obviously attracted to the light right uh let's see let's see where's the foamy virus question it was a good one too uh, i know it was from someone put up a foamy virus question it was good could you please put it up again because i'm not finding it for Paul here. Mm. Can coronaviruses, yeah, yeah. <laughs> A lot of people don't like flies, but they're not fruit flies. They're too big. They're too big. They're like a quarter inch long. I don't know. I guess they're, I don't know. I don't know anything about flies. Um, mm. uh, all right, so... Um, <clears throat> How did, how did you get to the U.S.? Let's finish that part of your career. Right. So um, as I was sort of coming to the end of my Ph.D. studies, I, I, you know, I think this is true in many, many countries. There's there is was and I, I hope and think still is a perception that science is just done at a higher level in the United States. And there's a there's a phrase we foreigners use. It's a, a qualification you get. It's called the BTA, been to America. Yeah. <laughs> um, so many, many senior scientists in the UK, and I think in many other countries, um, come to the US, do a postdoc um, or some other, some other training, and then return to their home countries. And it, it's, it's regard, at least was regarded as a natural part of uh, career progression for most people who were ambitious um, at that time. And so that, that sort of fitted into, into my plans. I, I wrote, wrote to a bunch of labs in, in the United States, um, actually including Maxine Lineal, um, um, but ended up uh, eventually working in Brian Cullen's lab at Duke University, where where I really um, um, spent the next three years working uh, exclusively on HIV. Um, initially on uh, virus entry, we studied the co-receptors. The HIV co-receptors were newly discovered then. Um, and we did some work showing that there was quite a bit of strain dependent variation in how HIV interacted with, with um, the CCR5 and CXCR4 co-receptors. Um, and then about halfway through my postdoc, um, I changed direction completely to work on uh, transcription. That's uh, um, essentially the process by which the HIV proviral DNA is transcribed to make new viral RNA. I see we've lost the light now. Well, someone said to turn it off and put a light on in another room and they would 
soon go to the other room. Five minutes. So I'm going to sit here in the dark for five minutes, and we'll see okay. if that works. Go ahead. Sorry. We can we can just we can just about see you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, so the, the latter part of my postdoctoral work was really understanding how uh, this, an HIV protein called TAT, um, it's sort of a switch that turns on HIV transcription. It's encoded by the virus. It uh, generates sort of a positive feedback loop that drives HIV transcription, essentially how that works. Um, and what another group had found um, during that time was that TAT binds to a transcription factor called PTFB, positive transcription elongation factor B. And so we did quite a bit of work characterizing that interaction, showing that the one of the reasons that HIV is a strictly human virus is that the, the PTFB, the, the host transcription factor to which TAT binds, um, the human version of it works, mm. um, but the the non-human versions of it often don't work. Um, don't work to um, interact with the HIV promoter to drive transcription. And so that that sort of um, I helped nail this as the as the bona fide uh, uh, host factor that HIV uses to drive its transcription. And also gave us a handle to try and try and make try and make mice um, that could replicate HIV. Um, mm. You'll re recall from your own career, there's always great interest in trying to make human viruses grow in mice, and sometimes you can make that happen simply by expressing a, a virus receptor in that in that mouse. <laughs> Right. <laughs> but but that doesn't work for HIV. The life cycle's too complicated. And one of the complications is that this this host transcription factor needs to be, uh, uh, or at least one amino acid that's different in humans and mice needs to be the human version for the transcription factor to work. Now, you, you may have mentioned this, but was, so does it explain anything different about HIV and SIV. So SIV would not have infected people until it spilled over. And so would this factor have worked immediately or need some adaptation? No, th this, this is, there are other species dependent blocks in SIV replication in human, but this okay. isn't one of them. Um, All right. Hold on a sec here. Let's try. So quite a few of them flew, went out the door. It was a good, good experiment. Let's see if they come back. I have to just ignore them, but I see a whole bunch of them on the ceiling lights in the other room. <laughs> dear, dear. All right. So, so um, that takes care of Duke. And then what did you do after that? So um, then it was time to um, start my own lab, um, which I did by moving to uh, New York City. Um, I set up shop at the Aaron Diamond AIDS Research Center, uh, which uh, now is at Columbia, but at that time um, was sort of downtown in the Public Health Laboratories building down on 26th Street and First Avenue. Mm. Um, so yes, I started my nascent group there uh, around 2000, beginning of 2000. And we okay. started working on a on a, a a few questions in HIV biology that sort of mushroomed, and uh, over the last <laughs> twenty three years, I've had uh, a really quite diverse set of interests um, <laughs> relating to HIV. At, so, at some point, you moved up the street, right, to Rockefeller. Right. So um, around twenty seventeen. Um, so throughout the those 17 years from 2000 to 2017, the Aaron Diamond AIDS Research Center was affiliated with Rockefeller University. So while my lab and my scientific life was mostly at the, at the Aaron Diamond, I had a faculty appointment here at Rockefeller. Um, but then in 2017, the for various complicated, mostly financial reasons, 
Um, the Aaron Diamond AIDS Research Center elected to change its affiliation from Rockefeller to Columbia University. Mm. Um, and so the entire place moved lock, stock and barrel from its, its home on 26th Street to Columbia University, where, where you're now based. Um, and I decided not to go with it. I actually, there are, you know, some advantages to being a, a Rockefeller faculty member. And so I elected to stay with the university rather than move with the center to, yeah. to Columbia University. No, it's, I, I totally agree with you. <laughs> Rockefeller is unique. And um, yes, it's a very it's special a place. Very special place. Uh, we had a question from Tom here. He wants to know, are there current mouse HIV models? So not in the sense we were trying to make and of the sort Vincent has made in the past for, for picornaviruses, where you essentially have a genetically modified mouse that's still a mouse that you can breed and, and so on and so forth, and then just infect with the human virus. That does not exist for HIV. Um, what we have for HIV is something that's different and not really quite as satisfactory. You can take mice that are profoundly immunodeficient, that essentially have no immune system of their own, don't make B cells, T cells, or many cells of the immune system. And then you can graft into them um, some in various ways, either just T cells from a human or pieces of fetal tissue and stem cells. And so they can generate um, something a little bit like a human immune system in which HIV can replicate uh, in a mouse host. Um, so that they recapitulate some features of HIV replication. The virus grows very well. It kills mm -hmm. the CD4 cells. You can treat the mice with drugs and antibodies and so on. But they don't make a very good immune response. Right. And you don't really have access to the power of mouse genetics to understand host, host virus uh, interactions. Some people rather unkindly call them furry tissue culture flasks. That, that's going a bit, a bit <laughs> too far. Um, and that they have, they have been useful in some, some aspects of studying HIV, but that, that wasn't what we wanted to generate. Um, what we wanted to generate is put, so, put a few human genes into a mouse and have HIV replicate um, in those mice. That has never worked. Um, there are too many other more complicated um, species incompatibilities between HIV-1 and mice that we just haven't gotten, gotten to the bottom of. There's been some progress. We know something about what goes wrong, but... Um, it's been a, a challenge that has defeated uh, defeated the field, actually. Yeah, and uh, it was for polio. It was very e it was deceptively easy, right? Because all it needed was the receptor, which is really remarkable. Because that means that everything beyond receptor works in a mouse cell for polio yeah. virus, which always surprised me. Which kind of suggests that maybe the original polio virus came from a rodent many many years ago, right? Right, right. Yeah. Some viruses are prone to be generalists. Yeah. Um, polio is not a generalist, but it, it can be persuaded to be a generalist if you just change a gene or two. HIV is not one of them. It is very fussy about the cells it infects. Here's a question from John. He wants to know, what is paleovirology and have anyone discovered anything that has found application as a result? <clears throat> wow. Okay. So paleovirology, um, actually different people have different meanings for that term. It, it's really the study of ancient viruses. Um, that can take sort of two different forms. Um, in one, one iteration, um, some people study human genes that are either used by viruses or provide a defense against viruses and just study variation in those genes um, 
and make deductions about the history of the interaction between viruses and their host. Um, on the other hand, there, there is a fossil record. Well, I got in, actually into trouble with Dixon for calling these things fossils, right? But there, <laughs> <laughs> there is something analogous to fossils of viruses in the DNA of modern organisms. Um, so retroviruses in particular, they, as part of their replication cycle, they insert a copy of their genome into uh, the DNA of a target cell. And sometimes, quite rarely, but sometimes that target cell can be a cell that is or will become what we call part of the germline, a sperm cell or an egg cell. Uh, and if that happens, then um, the viral genome is in, can be inherited uh, like any other gene, right? any other organismal gene. Um, obviously, for that to happen, the virus typically would have to have some inactivating mutation. Um, you could imagine it's it's quite likely to be deleterious to the host if that fertilized egg has a, a gene encoding a full-length virus in it. If that cell then divides and goes on to make a, a, a an offspring, if every cell has that inherited viral genome and it's making replicating virus, there's a fair chance that um, that offspring isn't going to make it. But retroviruses um, make mistakes sufficiently often that quite frequently those viral, viral genomes has be, have been inherited as human genes um, by organisms throughout evolutionary history. In fact, everyone who's listening tonight, um, eight, about 8% 8 of your DNA is actually the remnants of old retroviruses. Mm. Um, <laughs> there are more viruses in your DNA than there are genes, okay? They're all degraded to some extent. They, they have... Um, defects that were likely introduced introduced as they infected the germ cell line in your ancestors many mostly millions of years ago um, and there's no real evolutionary selection pressure to maintain them so they become further degraded over evolutionary time hmm. but what what actually we and thierry heidman were the first to do this was to go back and look at those sequences. And if for a particular virus, there are enough of those sequences that you can line them all up, right? And then figure out what the, what the original sequence is. Let's say you have 100, 100 copies of a, of a particular viral gene. They all have um, inactivating mutations in them. But almost all of those inactivating mutations will be different in every copy of the gene. So at, say, 98 or 99 out of 100 copies will be correct at every one particular part position in the sequence by just deducing a consensus sequence of all those partly degraded viral genes, you can deduce something that approximates to the ancestor of all those defective genes. And when you do that, what you find is that you, you magically reconstruct um, intact viral genomes. Mm. And so we did this for the first time in the early 2000s and rebuilt um, um, essentially an entire, entire viral genome for a virus called HERF K. It's called Human Endogenous Retrovirus K. That's a virus that um, has infected primates for many millions of years. And we can show that though those reconstructed viral proteins actually work. Um, you can do a complete replication cycle of this virus. We've done various projects where we've rebuilt um, envelope or spike proteins and found receptors for those viruses. Um, we've you know, rebuilt capsids, um, just it's just really a way to look back into the past and see what these, how these viruses worked. 
has anything useful <laughs> or an application that's come out of these? The answer so far is no. Um, we have a project that's been on the back burner for a long time, actually, because it, it turns out that one of the virus receptors that we identified using this approach is a, is a protein that's profoundly upregulated on some tumor cells. Okay, some virus re virus receptors always always have a, a a normal cellular function, quite apart from being virus receptors. Turns out that many virus receptors are metabolite transporters, um, and there's one of these that is profoundly upregulated on on uh, tumor cells. And so, what we we actually have built the virus. We've just never taken it into mouse models. We've built. A, a highly cytopathic virus that has on its on its surface the envelope protein of an ancient rebuilt endogenous retrovirus hmm. now that virus can uses this receptor that's expressed at high level on tumor cells and at least in cell culture we've never actually published this actually so <laughs> a bit of an exclusive here we can show that this virus will selectively infect and kill breast cancer cells that ha that highly mm. express this um, um, this ancient virus receptor. Mm. So that's a possible application. This yeah. um, there's an entire field called uh, oncolytic virus therapy, where you essentially use viruses to try to selectively uh, infect and kill cancer cells. And, so and when this you, could be could could have application there. So when you talk when you say ancient, how old? So the one that you recovered uh, that you mentioned earlier, how roughly how old was that? So so the both of those examples, the Herv K and the this other one, it's actually called Herv T. They're in the few tens of millions of years old, right? So Herv yeah. K replicated in humans after we speciated from chimpanzees most recently it probably died out about hmm. one or two hundred thousand years ago herve t was active from about 35 million years ago until about eight or ten million years ago so that that's a time window where we can work with these things if you go back further than that they're too degraded to really yeah. effectively yeah. reconstruct <clears throat> and hundred thousand years is Herv K is the most recently extinguished one. Um, you know, I can imagine if you did this experiment today, it would uh, raise the ire of certain individuals. Did you get any uh, pushback back then? Um, not, not too much. You know, <laughs> I mean, we we do this somewhat responsibly. It's not as if we just synthesize an entire viral genome and then have it replicate. What we tend to do is synthesize individual viral proteins and then make things like pseudotype viruses to study mm -hmm, the function mm -hmm. of the protein. So it's sort of a broken virus where you, you mix one part of one virus with another part of another virus, not on a single genetic construct. You use two, do, two different constructs to complement. So you don't actually make a virus that can do a full replication cycle. It can do part of a replication cycle um, that that's how we we sort of deal with the the squeamishness that people have with with, right. uh, with these right. things oh well, silvio pina thank you for your contribution to science education and also kip and laura thank you very much for your contribution to science education <laughs> the flies as you can see are still they're back they're buzzing <laughs> in front of me <clears throat> ehs talent by the way lived in norwich england for a decade or two ah there you excellent. go you know i was so young when i was there i can't even remember it <laughs> yeah yep <clears throat> all right tryon wants to know can coronaviruses change rna with hiv and make recombinants <sighs> <laughs> not not at sufficiently high frequency for it to matter um mm -hmm. you know coronaviruses recombine 
with themselves at astonishingly high frequency and HIV recombines with itself at astonishingly high frequency. But those things are going on in, in with two completely different mechanisms mm -hmm. in completely different parts of the cell. They really require that two different RNAs um, not interact with each other directly, but interact with each other indirectly through viral proteins that are totally different for the two viruses. And so I bet if you tried really, really hard and put lots of coronavirus and lots of HIV in the same cell, you could probably find very rare um, recombinant RNAs that had both HIV and coronavirus sequence. But that is, that is simply, and they, they would not be replication competent. They would be evolutionary dead ends for both viruses. So um, in almost every case, mm -hmm. in, in fact, in every case that I can imagine, they would be dead, evolutionary dead ends. So um, it's theoretically possible, but not sufficiently likely that right. I would be in any way worried about it. They infect completely different cells as well. That's a, that's another yeah. obstacle to it ever happening in yeah. nature. Okay, Laurie says, not a COVID question. Can viral serotypes differ in susceptibility and permissiveness to host cells? If so, could this result in different niches in the body that cannot be detected by antibodies in the blood? So not that we really know about. So the only, the only qualification I'd put on that um, rather blanket statement is that when the, the first Omicron came along, um, mm -hmm. it had a greater, greater tendency to do well with, um, uh, let's rewind a little bit. There's when the SARS-CoV-2 infects um, a cell, it attaches to a primary receptor, ACE2, and then it, the, the spike protein needs to be cut by one of two proteases to enable the fusion reaction that delivers the viral contents into the cell. So those two families of proteases, one is called temporous proteases, they're on the cell surface, and there's another family of proteins called the cathepsins. They're inside the cell in endosomes. And for the original strain, and I think most strains of SARS-CoV-2, either will do. Okay. But in reality, in lung cells that are the, you know, the primary target of newly transmitted SARS-CoV-2, it's temperus that's really the important one. Um, however, when Omicron, the first Omicron came along, it, it appeared, at least in cell culture, that that virus had a, a somewhat, um, did somewhat better with the cathepsins, the, the proteases that are inside the cell, rather than the tempresses that are on the surface of the cell. It was very unclear to me whether that played out at all in the human um, mm. infection, but it could be shown in certain animal models that there were fitness differences that correlated with the change in the use of proteases. Um, quite what it meant in humans. I'm, mm. I'm frankly skeptical. Um, yeah. Basically, people's lungs still got infected with Omicron um, yeah. as they did before. Yeah, because um, if there's a, if there's tempers on the surface, then it will get in there, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Les says, what do you say to people who think COVID variants are getting milder? Um, huh. I would say, um, have you done the experiment where you unleash those new variants on an immunologically naive population? And of course, the answer is no. Um, so as the virus has been changing, so have we been changing. We've been 
acquiring ever as a population ever increasing um, levels of immunity as we get infected as we get vaccinated and so it's really i would say a virtually impossible question to answer in a human population because that you just don't have the same population now as you did when you measured the the original um mildness or virulence of the um the original strains so um i i would say the evidence for that is not where i would like it to be to make a definitive statement <laughs> sorry to equivocate but you know I, I have colleagues who are knowledgeable who who have who have opinions on this that are different to mine and they might be right i mean if you if you if you look at the delta strain for example if you counted the number of people who were tested positive and the number of people who ended up in the hospital that ratio was different as compared to a few months earlier when um, a different strain was was circulating and it's possible that the delta variant was was more um pathogenic and that that went away with subsequent strains but i I'm sorry, but I'm just not sufficiently confident in the data to to make a definitive statement. Well, I think op observational uh, data are difficult, right? Because you mm -hmm. can't choose the population. It's not a controlled trial. So there are always confounding factors, age, uh, comorbidities, yeah. immunity. And when Omicron first arose in South Africa, they immediately proclaimed it was less virulent, but they forgot to tell us that the population being infected was younger and more immune, right? Which made a big difference. Yeah. So <clears throat> I think, as you say, the, the perfect experiment cannot be done. But, you yeah. know, Paul, people put Omicron in animals and, you know, it, it's apparently milder there. And famously, the, the postdoc from Charlie Rice, who, who went on to be you, right, and did the Omicron recombinant recombination experiments he, he said in animals it's um it's mild there but i'm not sure that, that you can extrapolate that to people right yeah it's it's very it's very difficult very difficult all right uh, carol says japan suspended hpv vaccine for eight years then resumed why did they do that oh this is an interesting story do you know this story paul i actually don't so hmm. they, they had side effects once they deployed the vaccine in the population, they had side effects that were not seen in the clinical trial. And, you know, um, what were some of these side effects? Um, <clears throat> headache, chronic pain, minor motor impairment, you know, not, not trivial. So they mm -hmm. su suspended vaccination, and they only... Uh, recently resumed. What year did they resume? I think last year, and um, which is good. But in the meantime, they've had a many-year gap of not vaccinating young women, and that's going to lead to cervical cancer, which is unfortunate. So it's not even clear that it was an issue with the vaccine at all. <clears throat> ah, so these this was observed only in Japan and not in other countries. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, here we go. Two questions. Could a monoclonal antagonize the HIV protein that inhibits interferon-induced BST2? Okay. Uh, no. There's really a... So the, for, the, for the audience who, who don't know the terminology, um, BST2 is a... Pro, or as I like to call it, tethering, is a protein that... Uh, cells make in response to seeing interferon that traps HIV particles on the cell surface. HIV makes a protein called VPU, whose major, um, maybe only role, is to actually bind to BST2 and remove it from the cell surface so the virus can um, bud through the cell membrane and go off and infect cells unimpeded by BST2, or tethering, as we called it. So um, making an antibody to the viral protein to block its interaction with BST2 is, in theory, possible, but practically no, because the way these two proteins interact is 
essentially an interaction that's embedded within the membrane. It's not ac accessible to an antibody. The VPU protein, the viral protein that, that, that gets rid of BST2, it's a very, very small protein and it, it really is only one what we call transmembrane helix that, that's actually the part that binds to BST2 and there's maybe a couple of amino acids that are exposed on the cell surface. Mm. Um, almost certainly not enough to get an antibody that would bind to it and prevent its interaction with BST2. Sorry, good idea, but it's, that's not, not going to work. All right, and the second question, do you reckon the COVID pandemic to be over? Hmm. <laughs> I think you're going to have to define pandemic for me. Well, you know, the, the pandemic is a, is a term that the WHO uses really to, to rally governments to say, we have a problem, you need to do things now, right? It's an, what right. do they call it, a public health emergency of concern, something like that, P-H-E-I-C, right? So they say there's a public health emergency of concern, and then they say there's a pandemic, and then they actually never declared the pandemic over. They just said there's no more public health emergency of concern, right? Okay. <laughs> so. Um, I don't know. I think it, this is, it, in a sense, it's playing semantic games, right? Clearly, there's a disease burden still, but it's, it's way, way down compared to to what it was i'd have trouble calling it a pandemic at this point yeah um we're on our on our route on our way down to what will eventually be a steady state of the human population living with a not insignificant but not catastrophic burden of human disease that's caused by sars-cov-2 Okay, Visto says, the lack of foamy virus in humans, could that be behavioral, cultural behavior eliminated them? It could. It could. Um, although I suspect, I suspect there's something biological. There, ha there, have, been, there have been a few human cases. Um, these are... In general, um, people who, ha who who work in zoos or uh, vets who who have handled primates that have been bitten by monkeys, mm. almost all the monkeys in zoos um, have a foamy virus, and they can transmit to humans. But in the in the small number of cases where it's been examined, the amount of virus replication in that infected human. Uh, has been very low, and they have not transmitted the virus to family members. Okay, mm. so it looks like it's kind of verging on a dead end host for at least that that subset of, of viruses can get infected, but the the R value naturally in humans seems to be less than one. I have to show you this, Paul. We have a listener from Coxsackie, New York. Ha. Huh. Isn't that great? Coxsackie viruses. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Um, I don't know if you can answer this one, but do you mind giving a brief history of Rockefeller University? I recall Dixon mentioning it several times. Did you run into him? I don't, you guys weren't there at the same time at all, right? No, 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 no. Um, Paul is young. Wow. <laughs> Gosh. Where do I start? Um, I, I, I don't think I can possibly do it justice. I, I am not a historian of the Rockefeller University, so any attempt I would make to, to, um, to do that would, would inevitably miss out something incredibly important. Um, I would maybe highlight a couple of things that have been discovered here um, and maybe point out that the Rockefeller University was was fairly newly established during the 1918 flu um, mm. um, pandemic. Uh, the The history and the role of the university in that pandemic is, I think, quite well documented. In um, is it John Barry who wrote the book The Great Influenza? Yeah, that's yeah. correct. So I, I'd encourage you to look 
there if that will certainly scratch your itch to know more about the history of Rockefeller University as it pertains to viruses. Some big things that have been discovered here. Um, partial credit for the discovery that genetic material is DNA. Mac mm -hmm. McCarthy, classic experiments um, um, with uh, in bacteria. Um, blood group antigens. Um, that's a discovery that is at least claimed by by Rockefeller. Um, obviously, I get a sort of a, a rather tilted uh, version of, of history here. Um, meningitis um, vaccines, um, Emil Gottschlich, that was that's a big, big contribution to public health um, um, made here. But th there's just there's just so many. Hmm. Um, I'll give you I'll give you one important statistic. Um, if if Rockefeller University was a country, um, we'd rank I think it's somewhere around seventh on the list of countries in terms of the number of Nobel prizes awarded to um, yeah. professors. Yeah, you have here. A, you have a lot of Nobel laureates. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's some ridiculously high percentage. I think it's about. Of all the Rockefeller professors there have ever been, about ten percent of them have won a Nobel Prize. Do they have the um, most? Let's see. Harvard has the most, huh? Yes, but it's about fifty times the size of us. Uh, that's true. They we have only have 80, 80 faculty, less than eighty faculty. Wow, I'm looking it up. Uh, Nobel laureates from Rockefeller. Let's see. Since it was founded in 1901, 26 mm -hmm. Nobel Prize winners have been associated with the university. Yeah. One of the first was uh, Peyton <clears throat> Rouse um, for the discovery of Rouse sarcoma virus, the first uh, virus virus induced transmissible solid tumor. Mm -hmm. um, he also won a no, another Nobel Prize in in virology for for, for no Shope, Shope fibroma virus no that that wasn't Peyton Rouse but that was an, another early um, yeah. Nobel Prize here um, most recently Charlie Rice of course for um, right. studies of of hepatitis C virus Charlie's lab is as active as ever. Um, um, basically enabling uh, studies of hepatitis C virus that led to the drugs that now make it a curable disease. Don't forget um, uh, uh, Max Tyler for yellow fever vaccine. Yep. Yep. As I said, if I know if I tried to do it, I'd no, it's okay. But really that's important. the only, that's the only Nobel prize for a specific vaccine. <clears throat> right. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. You, Put me under a little too much pressure for me to um, um, uh, recite recite all the achievements of, <laughs> of the university, um, but it really the the original sort of intent behind it was was to develop a, a, a research. It originally was not a university; it was was a research institute focused on human disease, and at the turn of the century. Infectious disease was was really the, really the biggest biggest killers. Then, obviously, over time things have changed, but the university, unlike many other universities, has sort of retained its um, ethos of staying small. Um, unlike other universities, we haven't expanded. We have not had a series of presidents who judged judge their achievement by how many new buildings they can put on campus. <laughs> As I say, we still have only 70 faculty. Uh, about half of our faculty are National Academy members. Um, so it's a real focus on quality, not on quantity. Hmm. We, we don't come top in rankings of numbers of papers or, or you know, any volume related yeah. um, um, criteria but we always come top in impact per paper right there's not another university that's even close to us right our papers are cited more than papers from any other university so is, is the 
desire to stay small intentional or is it just restricted also because you don't have a lot of space to build out in right <laughs> it's it's intentional we we can always build up right okay um there have there's been an occasional president who's thought about doing that but has been um you know Discouraged. curtailed in their plans <laughs> the, the other the other great advantage it gives us is that um you know with obviously all universities have an endowment uh, a uh, a pot of money that they use mm -hmm. proceeds from to finance their research. And by not growing, it means that our labs are very generously funded. Um, and so with that general, that generous level of funding comes an expectation of quality and achievement. Um, and so that, that has been the ethos. It's not been, yeah. we want to be the biggest university in the world we want to do the the highest quality science um, that's what makes this place i think special and and i wouldn't say unique but um unusual at least uh stixon was there when peyton rouse was still alive by the way <laughs> wow <laughs> he met him <laughs> he met him thank you uh abdul for your contribution and uh, yeah it's probably very late in saudi arabia so uh Good night. Um, uh, well, maybe you'd know this. Is there a difference in the effect of this between Novavax booster versus Pfizer? That I'm, I'm afraid I do not know. Um, I think maybe it would no be one hard, hard to show at this stage, right? Because you'd, you'd really need to do controlled trial with a controlled population at, and at this point there's so much heterogeneity in the pre-existing yeah. immunity of the populations um you'd have to design that trial extremely carefully and how are we measuring effectiveness um yeah. are we measuring infection are we measuring mild disease severe disease death you know yeah it's 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 a challenge i think you know they're both good right i wouldn't yeah. i wouldn't worry about taking either speaking of insects what can you explain the novavax vaccine growing in a moth <laughs> so this is this is um i i don't recall they're using a baclovirus to make that one or i yeah. believe so yeah so um this is this is um it's not actually growing in a moth it's growing in a cell line that originally came from a moth so you can culture these um, moth cells in huge great fermenters at very high density and the reason you use moth cells or sometimes other insect cells is that those cells can be infected by a virus called a baclovirus. Baclovirus is a really, really quite interesting. They grow to ridiculous, ridiculously high levels. So if you, you find a, an actual moth infected with a, an actual baclovirus in, um, in nature, you'll even find sort of crystals, accumulations, lumps of that virus in that moth. It, it takes over um, nearly the entire biosynthetic capacity of the of the cell to make viral proteins and so what biotechnologists have done have, have harnessed that to make um, recombinant vectors based on baclovirus that, that you can then infect moth cells in cell culture but you've you've engineered that baclovirus to not not just make viral proteins but but make the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein and so all that biosynthetic capacity is 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 diverted to make spike protein, which is then um, secreted by the cells and then harvested by Novavax workers to, to manufacture uh, the vaccine. So the moth is just so you can use this, these baclaviruses that are just fantastic engines for making proteins. Why is it so difficult to develop an effective vaccine for HIV? <laughs> Aha. Uh -huh. Well, um, everybody, I think by now understands how SARS-CoV-2 
has varied and each time there's a variant the the vaccine gets a little less effective because the antibodies don't bind quite as well uh, or a few less antibodies um, uh, bind and that that's that sort of loss of interaction with antibody um, is progressive as the the virus evolves further and further away from the ancestral strain now um Sorry to anthropomorphize viruses um, for just a second, but this will help. When HIV looks at SARS-CoV-2 and sees how much it, its genetic variation is, um, it would scoff, um, scoff rather loudly at the evolutionary rate that <laughs> SARS-CoV-2 because, because HIV is, uh, evolves so much faster um, the amount of genetic variation in HIV dwarfs that of SARS-CoV-2 by um, a ludicrous amount. Um, think of another way to show this. So if I drew a, a family tree with, who's, um, with branches on it, each of one which represents a SARS-CoV-2 variant, um, the size of that tree might be, the, say, the size of my fingertip right? The, the corresponding size of the tree where the branch lengths are, are proportional to genetic distance would be much larger than the screen that you're watching this mm -hmm. on. It's just, it's orders of magnitude. Um, so as we've watched SARS-CoV-2 um, evolve to escape the antibodies over periods of months or years, as we've made vaccines to SARS-CoV-2, that the analogous situation uh, can occur in a single HIV infected individual. So if I, let's say uh, I sampled an HIV infected individual and I took blood plasma and I took virus from that person at one time point, the virus has already mutated to become resistant to the antibodies in that person at that time. Okay. If I took the virus from that person six months ago, the, vi the antibodies that I took today would probably neutralize that six month old virus, but the virus is already a step ahead of the immune system in that individual. So just that, that incredibly high evolutionary rate has generated just so much diversity that it's incredibly challenging to even make a handful of antibodies that will recognize multiple HIV strains. Um, and again, this, the same is, is true to an extent with the T cell epitopes as well. So we suspect that um, um, most of what the majority of the way that SARS-CoV-2 vaccines are now working to keep people out of the ground is at least in part by recognition of T-cell epitopes that are less variable in SARS-CoV-2. Um, in HIV, you can absolutely follow in single individuals, escape in individual T-cell epitopes over the course uh, of an infection. Um, and so the, just the, the moving target nature of the problem is just, just infinitely greater for HIV. Isn't That's also, really why it's so hard. Isn't also part of the problem that you, within two weeks of infection, you establish a latent reservoir. So if you don't block that entirely, you're screwed, right? Yes, that that that's also true. Um, so it has to be yeah. a sterilizing vaccine, and as far as we know, we we really can't do that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Although I would say if, if you did make, if there wasn't that variation, if you had an immune response that kept that latent reservoir in check, okay, right, yeah, yeah, you would, you would in theory have an effective vaccine, but we can't even do that. So, um, your okay. problem is, is a real problem, but, um, yeah, we don't even get to that problem because of the, yeah. the variation. Uh, Paul, do you have a condensed explanation of how tethering and MX2 inhibit viral replication for non-expert 
enthusiasts. Okay. All right. Briefly, tetherin is a. Uh, it's the same protein as what a earlier listener uh, referred to as BST two. It's essentially a rod shaped protein that has a membrane anchor at either end. Okay. And it sits in the, the membrane of a, of a cell. Um, and when a, an HIV or in principle, any envelope virus leaves that cell by budding through the cell surface, sort of as my hands are moving now, um, the, the membrane extrudes, surrounds the inner, um, contents of a virus. And then, um, there's a scission event that ena enables the virus particle to release as that process is happening. What tethering does, it manages to insert one of its two membrane anchors into the lipid, uh, envelope of the viral particle. And so when the particle tries to leave it, it finds itself trapped, um, via these membrane anchors, this protein rod shaped protein that has one end in the virus and one end in the cell. And it just, you know, the virus particles then accumulate on the infected cell. And instead of going off in the circulation to find new cells to infect, they stay by the thousand associated with the one cell that, um, that was, whose fate was already sealed. Um, mm. And so HIV makes a protein whose only job is essentially to remove tethering from the cell. Um, MX2 is a totally different protein. Um, what it does is it seems to patrol nuclear pores. So um, when HIV infects a cell, the virus particle spills its guts into the cytoplasm of the target cell. It has a capsid and inside the capsid is the viral RNA that gets reverse transcribed to make DNA. And uh, either that entire structure or some part of it has to access the nucleus by traversing nuclear pores. And what MX2 seems to do, um, this, just be clear that MX2 is not normally made by cells. It's only made when cells see interferon. Okay, it's the, the signal that cells receive to say, watch out, there are viruses about, it makes this protein called MX2. And what MX2 does, it sits on nuclear pores and it blocks by mechanisms we don't fully understand at this point, blocks certain preferred nuclear transport pathways that are used by HIV to enter the nucleus. And so the instead of going into the nucleus and integrating its DNA into the host um, DNA, uh, the viral DNA get, gets stuck in the cytoplasm, um, probably in association with the capsid, and then the virus can't complete its, its life cycle. That's how MX2 works. By the way, folks, we have 150 of you and 100 likes. Please hit the like button. Helps attract more people to the stream. That must mean 50 people don't like it. Right? Well, they just haven't said one way or the other. Uh, Visto wants to know, could the HIV receptor be blocked by drug or antibody? Yes, absolutely. So there is a drug called Maraviroc that binds to one of the two receptors that HIV uses. Um, for reasons that are not completely clear to me that, well, there is, there, is a, there is a little bit of a side effect issue with that drug, but um, it's, it's, it's effective. It works um, pretty much as well as any other HIV drug to, to, to block infection and, and would be very commonly used if there weren't just better drugs that target um, uh, vir viral enzymes. That, that, that totally works. Um, there, are, there are also antibody-based drugs that are uh, used much less frequently, sometimes in salvage therapy, that actually bind to the CD4 receptor. Um, obviously, people get a little bit um, nervous about putting antibodies on CD4. The, the, there's a potential for interference with the immune system. 
But in the studies that have been done, um, well, first, the, the, the antibody that has been licensed, in fact, it is FDA approved. It, it binds to a part of the CD4 that isn't normally required for CD4's function in the immune system. Um, and so that, that's a drug called ibilizumab um, and, is, and is used, as I say, in salvage therapy. Again, it's not a preferred therapy, but it, it, it can, can be and is used. There's, there are even some more experimental CD4 antibodies that, in fact, are absolutely predicted to interfere with CD4's function in the immune system. Um, and, but, and in just a, a very small number of patients, those have also been used with apparently without ill effects in terms of effects on CD4 cells. So there's no reason in principle you can't block the receptors with antibodies to inhibit HIV. And in fact, we ourselves are trying to develop such an antibody, not for HIV, but for SARS-CoV-2. Um, what's great about anti-receptor antibodies is that they, at least in principle, should be resistance proof, right? You, the virus can't easily evolve to just use a different receptor and can't evolved to evade the antibody because the antibody is not even binding to the virus. The, vir the antibody is binding to the receptor. Um, and so I, I'm actually a, quite a fan of these approaches and, and they absolutely would be used in HIV therapy, as I say, were it not for the fact that there are better drugs that target the viral enzymes. Yeah, the resistance to Maravarak arises by changes in GP120, right? <laughs> right. So, so, so that, that, that is a, that is a, um, that's a small molecule binding to a big receptor, right? So what, what mm -hmm. the virus, you would think that the virus might change GP120 and use a different receptor, which we know HIV can do, but actually what happens is the virus use, evolves to use the drug bound receptor. Mm -hmm. It accommodates the drug. Right, which right. was a surprise when it was originally found, but right. now we we are no longer surprised by the tricks HIV can play. Um, let's see what was here. Mark Martin is here from Matters Microbial. I have no trouble with discussing viral fossils. Think of the defective prophages of E. coli being Darwinoed into more genome by random mutation, like the rusting hulk of a sunken ship. Darwinoed. That's a good one. <laughs> That's a nice word. I like. I like that. that, that and Mark says herbs are so general. cool. Yes, herbs are very cool. They are. They are indeed. Um, I sort of left that out of the discussion earlier, but it, it is absolutely true that some of pieces have been co-opted by their hosts as yep. as uh, genetic material for the advantage of the host. <clears throat> So, Paul, do you know what's happening with COVID-19 antiviral development? Hmm. I, uh, I do not have, you know, um, uh, insight into what uh, pharmaceutical companies are doing. I understand there are development efforts for various classes of, of drugs, both in academia and in industry. There are actually big um, um, uh, NIH-funded virtual centers that are, um, hmm. some of which are collaborations between academia and industry to develop a whole range of antiviral drugs, not just for coronaviruses, although coronaviruses are a big part of this, but but other families of viruses um, that that have the potential to cause pandemics so mm -hmm. so we don't get caught with our pants down again um, so it's 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 happening what the whether those things will be brought to fruition so that we have stockpiles of effective drugs when SARS-CoV-3 comes along I don't know but um, certainly that at the current time there is sufficient um, memory and interest for those efforts to to 
to proceed. And some of the biology and biochemistry that I've seen associated with the drug development efforts, um, particularly with the replication complex, the RNA polymerases and all its associated activity, the sort of the basic um, biochemistry and drug development is going hand in hand in a way that's actually very nice to see, um, both for a scientist and a drug developer. Airy Ozone wants to know why ancient or any viruses ultimately inactivate. Aha, uh -huh. that is a good, good question. And it, it's, it, it's likely not one answer. Um, I can give you one scenario that we, uh, we think happened for one of the viruses that, that we studied, but I very much doubt that this is, this is the case, um, uh, universally. Um, but you, you could, I guess you could think of the answers as theoretically um, um, pigeonholing them into changes in behavior, um, changes in the biology of the host. Um, it's hard it's hard to imagine how a virus would change to in a way that would lead to its extinction that's sort of mm. contrary mm. to every anything you might think about in terms of darwinian uh, processes but but certainly certainly those other two changes in behavior you know we we behave completely differently today than we did just a few hundred years ago right just the customs that we have in terms of our interactions with each other. Um, so I, I absolutely think that the, the passage of infectious disease can be massively influenced by behavior. I mean, just cooking food, for example. That, that, yeah. Right. Um, changes in biology. You, you, you obviously, our genomes are just full of the evidence of Darwinian selection on immune genes, adaptive and innate immune genes, um, that are likely many of them are examples of evolutionary arms races that we won, right? And our prize for winning was survival, right? And the virus's prize for not winning that was extinction. We just evolved to become resistant to those, those, um, those viruses. So the, the one one special example um, that that I think is is an example of that, with a little twist, comes with this this virus Herve T that we studied. This is a virus that replicated in our primate ancestors from about thirty five million years ago until about five million years ago. Um, and, and we know the age of these uh, virus insertions into the genome based on their presence in certain primate species, but not others. So let, let's say you find um, uh, an endogenous retrovirus genome in a specific place in a genome that's present in, say, um, uh, orangutans, gorillas, and uh, chimpanzees, and humans. You can reasonably deduce that that virus was inserted into the genome before the speciation events that led to the existence of those species. But if you find an, ins uh, an endogenous retrovirus in a specific place in a genome in humans and chimpanzees, but not in gorillas and not in orangutans, and not in any other primates, you can reasonably deduce that virus was inserted uh, between about six million years ago and about, uh, I forget when gorillas diverged from, um, from, that, from that lineage. So we can date these things. So that's how we know that this, vi this virus Herve T replicated from about 35 million years ago until about 10 or 15 million years ago. What we also find uh, for this virus is an insertion into 
the genomes of modern primates, so chimpanzees, gorillas, um, orangutans, is a piece of the viral genome that encodes the envelope protein, the outer protein of the virus, okay? And amazingly, unlike all the other copies of the virus in the, in the, in the human genome, this envelope protein is intact. It, it actually can encode a full length protein. What we, and what we were able to show is that this protein, when you express it in, when you cause it to be made in a target cell, it actually can cause resistance to the same virus if we rebuild that virus in an infectious form. And so what, what can happen is if, if your cells make an envelope protein, that protein can block the receptor so that the infectious virus can't, can no longer infect those cells. Um, and so this looks like it happened um, sort of 10, 10, 15 million years ago in the um, primate lineage, the mm -hmm. great ape lineage. Um, and possibly, possibly that's what led to Herv K extinction. Um, we know that similar phenomena um, happen in modern organisms. So you can find laboratory mice or chickens, for example, where you can find um, modern uh, retrovirus envelope proteins encoded in the DNA of those modern organisms, and they are absolutely resistance lo loci for infectious viruses that use the same receptor. So actually borrowing a piece of the virus to make something that blocks a receptor or other protein that the virus might use is one way that viruses can, at least in principle, go mm. extinct. Uh, but that's one of many possible mechanisms that we genetically could acquire resistance to virus infection. All right. <clears throat> Here's a, a little change. Can HIV be transmitted between herpes lesions? <laughs> Gosh, I don't know, but I wouldn't want to try. Um, uh, I I would imagine that's pretty unlikely, but um... so the idea would be that <clears throat> the lesion has some has blood a bit in of it. blood. Yeah. yeah. So in theory, in theory, yes. In practice, I have no no insight into whether the the efficiency of that transmission yeah. would be enough for it to be a real risk. I guess the idea would be, I mean, it would be genital herpes, right? That's what we're talking about yeah. here, probably, yeah. Not, yeah. not oral, okay. Um, has anyone <clears throat> done an experiment to find out how far a SARS-CoV-2 virus that is exhaled travels in the air and how long does it stay in the air? Okay, so... the this to me is one of those um, how long is a piece of string questions. Um, <laughs> so th I think it's really the, the, dr the nature of the droplets that the SARS-CoV-2 um, virus is in, right? So if it's in a, a very small droplet, it can linger in the air for significant amounts of time. Um, I honestly don't recall what the what the literature arrived at as a conclusion about how long it, how long these things can stay in the air um, maximally. Um, I think there's been quite a lot of um, hot air, if you pardon the <laughs> phrase, about whether SARS-CoV-2 is droplet transmitted or aerosol transmitted. Um, I think the bottom line is it can be aerosol transmitted, but um, whether it is or not would really depend on an individual case, what the viral load is in that particular yeah. person, yeah. Yep. right? The more virus you have, 
the greater probability you have of a virus particle being in one of those tiny, long-lived um, aerosol droplets. Um, so it's 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 there's no there's no bright line I think where you can give a definitive answer. And to be frank, I think sort of the variation from individual to individual is probably so large it's not that helpful to try to even. Mm make generalizations i mean people have that you could you could show that it's in aerosols but you don't know if it's enough to infect anyone <laughs> right 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 um vincent yeah. munster at rocky mountain lab has done some transmission ex experiments and using cages that are connected by long tubes <laughs> uh-huh but he's forcing the air through it it's not a natural situation right yeah Just, so I mean, the only yeah. way you could do it is a human challenge, and only one of those has been done, right? Which where they pipetted the the virus into the nose, so we it doesn't tell us anything, right? Yeah, those those are artificial situations, and yeah. So but it's and, clear you know, it's in the air; it's in respiratory droplets. That's very yeah. clear, right? Right, and and not as much touching and fomites, right? Yes. So we we were. Um, absolutely, probably <laughs> not correct early in the pandemic to insist that people wash their groceries. Right, right, right. I'll put my hand up and say, yeah, I was wrong about that. That was not, not, not the best advice. Well, we didn't know, right? We didn't know. We didn't know. Doreen, thank you for your contribution to science communication. Really appreciate it. And also John. John says, Paul, you and your wife have a great way of explaining things. I liked your TWIV appearances and hope you return periodically. <clears throat> well, we're planning another return of Paul and Theodore. Theodore Hatsianu, by the way, who has been on TWIV with Paul. You should know they are married because they've been on TWIV together. And uh, mm -hmm. Theodore is a co-author on Principles of Virology. Um, do, here's one. Do endogenous viral elements play a role in immune evasion? Hmm. Um, yeah. <laughs> Not really. Um, the endogenous viral elements, do, parts of them do play a role in regulating expression of gene innate immune genes in the immune system but but not not as far as i know in evasion of immunity by viruses yeah i i, I agree with that i don't know of any either <clears throat> um so artemis wants to know Washing hands for 20 seconds to de deactivate viruses. How was the 20 second <laughs> conclusion reached? <laughs> I have no idea. I'm sorry. So the hand washing for surgeons, right? But it's, it's like you say right. the alphabet, right? That's about 20 seconds. It's just empirically determined that that would lower the bacterial. Con it's not going to eliminate it, but they do not just yeah. washing. They do scrubbing, right? They often have brushes that they use yeah. to scrub and scrub and scrub. Yeah. Uh, is it possible to have an asymptomatic HIV AIDS? Right. Well, let's just, just clarify some terminology here. So HIV is the virus, right? Um, AIDS is a disease. So you can't have asymptomatic AIDS. AIDS, by almost by definition, has right. symptoms associated with it. Um, the course of HIV infection... Uh, very often, in almost every case, in fact, has a, as a, an extended asymptomatic phase. The typical course of disease is to, is to um, become infected, have an acute viral sy syndrome in, in, in many cases, a sort of a flu-like um, illness that resolves. And then a period of what can be many years of, of no clinical disease. Um, we used, we used to erroneously think of that phase as a sort of latent phase, but clinical latency is absolutely not viral latency because what was actually going on during those untreated, asymptomatic, clinically latent phases 
was that the, the, the CD4 cells were being infected and killed at an astonishingly high rate. This attrition was going on over years and years, gradually killing off the cells, the helper T cells uh, in the body so that um, up to a decade or more later, your body's capacity to generate those helper T cells is exhausted. Mm -hmm. And then you essentially succumb to op op the opportunistic infections that are AIDS. But for, for many years, people just didn't didn't know that they they were that their body was engaged in this battle between uh, cells and virus um aries Ari ozone says the physical plant of rockefeller is barely known even among residents of that part of the lower east side this is the upper east side the lower yeah. upper east side oh i guess it's the lower yes. upper east yes. side oh. lower east. Yeah. <laughs> okay <laughs> Um, yeah. Artemis says, is there an agreed to definition of severe disease? I guess with respect to COVID, right? Severe COVID. Uh, that, that, that's something better asked of a physician than, than <laughs> me. I, I would guess if you need to be admitted to hospital, that will count as severe disease. Sounds like a good working definition to yeah, me. Yeah. So Paul Offa used to talk about that. He said, the problem with that is sometimes, you know, they test you when you're admitted for any reason, they used to anyway, for COVID, and then you would test positive. If you're coming in for hernia surgery, you test positive. So now you're a COVID case, and no matter what happens to you, oh, you I see. Good, you know, so it's pull off and say, maybe it's better if you end up in the ICU to, to use that, or if you need oxygen or something right. like that. It's a tough yeah. one, though. It's very tough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Agreed. <clears throat> uh, Lori says, isn't Ralph Steinman the only person to get the Nobel posthumously? I believe that's true, yes. And I remember well the day that that happened because um, I was actually taking my son to the daycare center here and I met one of the other parents, physicist called Marcelo Magnasco, and he delivered both pieces of news simultaneously on the Monday morning. Did you know Ralph Steinman won the Nobel Prize and he died? I mean, mm. that's just it's just a you know, a shocking thing to hear. And yeah. uh, as far as I know, the only person. Uh, Vanity, Vanity, one of our moderators, when studying a virus with zoonotic capability, do you study parasite immunity of the reservoir population for potential treatments? Bacteria, CRISPR and restriction enzyme functions make it seem there could be something there. <clears throat> Yeah, I think we're mixing too many things here. Um, so basically, Paris, why, you know, if there's a, is a reservoir for a potential zoonotic uh, virus, could could you say why is the reservoir resistant to disease? Is that is that going to be useful, right? Okay, okay. Um, yeah, I think there are just too many counterexamples for that to to be mm. to be a useful. Um, we, uh, I mean, in this in the context of HIV, for example, um, we know that the viruses that at least some of the viruses that cause AIDS in humans, HIV two in particular, um, while quite dangerous to humans is seems not to be dangerous in the natural host um but we we haven't i think ever really gotten to the bottom of that biology and it it, it may be too complex and to to really learn anything specific and actionable in in the context of the human human disease Dr. Binesh, any views on the CMV-based HIV vaccine described by Dr. Fu on TWIV 1057? <laughs> okay, so so sorry I didn't listen to TWIV 1057. I, I'm somewhat familiar of at least of earlier iterations of Dr. Fru's work. Um, um, he's been working with Lewis Picker, I believe, at the mm -hmm. yep, uh, Oregon right. Primate Center. And um, 
my recollection was that they could protect about half the monkeys um, with a, 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 a CMV based um, SIV vaccine. Mm. Um, and then, but when the, when they rechallenged the immune monkeys, again, half of them were protected. Right. Um, <laughs> That's really challenging to get one's head around in terms of mechanism. Um, they, they've made some progress, I understand, on um, non-conventional MHCs as being a, a likely component of the immunity. That's right. Um, and as I understand it, there are trials at least planned. Um, you, you, your audience is probably more up to date than I am to this, having listened to him re recently. But but my view is is it's it's in principle very promising. I I just would really like to know what the mechanism is because you'd like to be able to mimic it without having to give people a replication competent CMV. Yeah. This, so the it's this unusual MHC, but there's also these effector memory T cells. <laughs> Right, it's a weird right. population of T cells that are involved. But he said that gives you long term persistent immunity, right? It's not just a, it's not a, a it's durable. So right. that may be the, um, the key there. But he isn't, they are enrolling in a trial. A company is doing that. Right. So uh, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, yeah. Will wants to know, are there things we've discovered about SARS-CoV-2 which have been possible because of our knowledge of common cold coronaviruses? <clears throat> yeah. Yes. I mean, the fundamental sort of biology of coronaviruses was, was mostly worked out well, partly with common cold coronaviruses, partly with murine coronaviruses, MH, mouse hepatitis virus, for example. Um, but the basic, so how do we know um, what a spike protein was, for example? How do we know what a receptor binding domain was, for example? That, that was all worked out prior to SARS-CoV-2 coming along. So, um, you know, this, this incredibly rapid process of taking that spike gene, making a, an mRNA-based vaccine of it, you had to know quite a lot about the biology of coronaviruses in general um, to be confident that that was a, even a sensible thing to do. And at least some of that was worked out um, with common cold uh, coronaviruses. Um, knowing what the RNA polymerase was, um, the protease, all, all those drug targets, knowing what things to go after required a sort of a, a baseline knowledge of coronaviruses, some of which was done with common cold coronaviruses, um, and some of which was done with related animal viruses. So, the, I mean, it, you know, the, the lesson here is it, it is it is very important to study viruses that are not um, highly lethal pathogens, so that when a relative comes along that is a highly lethal pathogen, you you, you have a starting point. So, um, in terms of things like epidemiology and transmission, I I'm of the opinion that. We, we could have done better in that respect. So there was this dogma around with the common cold coronaviruses before SARS-CoV-2 came about that, that reinfection was just due to infection, immunity, waning immunity, reinfection. Right. right. Nobody, nobody had any real systematic studies of antigenic variation in the common cold coronaviruses. Yeah. They were done after SARS-CoV-2 came along and showed what we should have known before, that yeah. these viruses are incredibly antigenically variable. Had we known that, we would not have 
stood in front of everybody and said, ah, we have a 95% effective vaccine. Yeah, we're done. We're right? done. Yeah. No, I, th I think that is really important. Yeah. I think those yeah. are Jesse Bloom, right? Experiments. Yeah. Yeah. And there's another group in the Netherlands that did, did that too. But yes, we, uh, you know, early in the pandemic, I sat on Zoom meetings with professional corona virologists mm. who told me we have a um, 40 year old plasma that neutralized modern um, common cold coronaviruses. <laughs> and that was just wrong. Right. Mm. And it was just because people hadn't carefully documented when viruses were isolated and so on and so yeah. forth. We yeah. just didn't have that. All, all, everything we know about things like H, HIV and HCV and flu, that antigenic variation that's so very carefully documented because those are disease causing viruses or severe right. disease causing viruses. We just didn't have that knowledge for coronaviruses. Right. Uh, are there plans for any more polymutant spikes or did PMS 20 serve to answer all we need to know with regard to SARS-CoV-2 variants? <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough one, right? All we need to know. <clears throat> um, we are actually still like, we're, we're not doing the, the same experiment. So for your listeners who, who, who may not be familiar with that experiment, uh, basically what we did um, after, after doing a bunch of in vitro antibody selection experiments, we sort of made, it, made a guess at what a virus would look like if it escaped all the antibodies that were all the neutralizing antibodies that were in circulation. We called that virus PMS20 because it was poly mutant spike with about 20 mutations. And it wasn't exactly what Omicron turned out to be, but it was close enough that um, we felt like we made a pretty, pretty good guess at predicting what uh, an antigenic shift variant would, would look like. Um, so having done that once, I think you can only do that once because you need you need um, really fairly immature antibodies where one amino acid causes escape to each type of antibody for that experiment to work. Um, we we are sort of we have continued to study the um, evolution of the virus, but what we're doing now is. Um, trying to use that knowledge of genetic variation to try to make um, not polymutant, well, in a sense, polymutant, polymutant and polyvalent vaccines. So we are, we've made a, a whole series of synthetic immunogens that don't necessarily have natural combinations of mutations, but we pick and choose um, naturally occurring mutations in various epitopes and make different um, uh, cocktails of RBD proteins that have different sets of mutations. And we are immunizing mice either as a pool or sequentially in various ways to try and make as broad a set of antibodies as possible. And the experiment we're doing, this is, this is I think this is, this is a good experiment. And actually, this this serves as a very useful forum to publicly document this. What we're going to do is in the next mm -hmm. month or two is immunize mice with what we hope will be a broadly protective vaccine. And one year from now, we're going to challenge those mice with whatever virus strain mm -hmm. is circulating then as a test of whether we were able to make a vaccine that generates immunity that lasts a long time in the face of antigenic um, variation. So you heard it here, and I'll be able to refer back to this um, podcast as a public public declaration of our intent. <laughs> and you can ho hold us to um, whether we were successful or not. That'll be, that'll be an interesting experiment. I like that. Mm -hmm. So shortly after PMS 20 was published, Omicron emerged, remember? Yeah. Yes. Yes. With, with um, did, did it have all the same changes or more than? No, it was. It, so, yes, I, I 
didn't finish my sentence. It, so PMS 20 was close enough to Omicron for us to feel good about what our predictions were. Right. But it, it wasn't, wasn't exactly the same. Um, right. You know, you're, you're never going to precisely predict, sure. um, predict evolution. But it, it was close enough that some of the more enthusiastic of the lab leak uh, community um, felt able to accuse us of being responsible for the um, generation of Omicron in our lab. Well, they failed to recognize that you made a uh, pseudovirus, right? Not SARS-CoV-2. Right. <laughs> yes. So, yes. So, just shows also, to I, show that the lab leakers don't know what they're talking about. That, yeah. Yeah. Have you, as you have heard tonight, Paul is uh, much kinder and judicious than I am. <laughs> I don't think he'd ever say someone doesn't know what they're talking about. He's too kind. <laughs> um, At least not in public. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say that if it weren't in front of an audience. But um. yeah, <laughs> where do you think Omicron came from? Um, so. I, I'm very much of the opinion that it's likely to have arisen in uh, a long-term infected individual or, mm -hmm. or group of individuals. Um, okay. It's, you know, we've seen enough, enough anecdotal cases where people have carried virus for, for many weeks. Right. And right. seen the, seen not the same changes, but related changes. Some, some of the same changes uh, clearly accumulate over the course of a long-term infection where somebody's making some level of antibody, neutralize, enough neutralizing antibody to place evolutionary pressure on the virus, yeah. but not enough to clear it. Um, and of course, um, the, what's different about the virus replicating in one person with antibody pressure being applied that's different, and I think this is an underappreciated point as well, that's different to when the virus passes from person to person, uh -huh. right? Is that when it's passing from person to person, every five days, few days, whatever the, the, the generation time from person to person is, the viral population is going through a very tight bottleneck. It's likely that transmission might might even involve a single infectious unit or a single mm. person infectious unit and that that mm. event essentially erases all the genetic variation that's that's in the viral population that acc accrued in that person um i think that is in large part why that plus the absence of population immunity is why we saw such slow evolution of the virus during the first year of the pandemic. Right. Um, but that that obviously doesn't apply in a in a, a person who's chronically carrying the virus, um, making antibodies. There's just just a huge, a vast population, billions of viral variants, all battling for supremacy. And under those conditions. Um, the fittest in the presence of antibody wins out, and that's why you accumulate all those all those substitutions. Right. Uh, so, G. Ferraro wants to know what you talk you guys talk about over dinner, you and, and Theodore. Do you talk science or not? Never, <laughs> or do you maybe never have dinner together? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, actually, tonight is one of the few nights that we're not having dinner together. We actually make a point of having dinner with our with our children pretty much every night, and we our kids just don't let us talk about science. Um, <laughs> and we, you know, we've worked together for a long time. We've gotten pretty good at compartmentalizing our lives. So work stays mm. at work generally, and home stays at home. Obviously, the pandemic was completely different that took over yeah. our lives completely we neglected our children it was um you know for those couple of years uh viruses was almost all we talked about but no over dinner we talk about politics we talk about what the kids did at school that day um normal normal family stuff right 
All right, maybe this will be our last question here from Melanie. Is there a cure for AIDS? Ah, uh, not yet, but we're working on it. <laughs> Will there be one, you think? So cure means you're infected, and then somehow you, you take out the infection, right? Right. Actually clearing the virus, I think that's going to be a challenge that Mm. That might be insurmountable. It's possible. It's possible that we could engineer a situation where everybody becomes an elite controller. Um, mm -hmm. So they suppress virus to low levels without the need for drugs. That I'm more confident about than being able to clear, clear the, clear the virus. Um, um, you know, obviously, there's there's quite a lot of effort going into this research enterprise, sure. and you know, it, it's possible that it, it'll be unsuccessful. But <clears throat> well, there's no, there are 35 million people infected at the moment, right? Something like that, right? So yes, there's big, yeah, big um, impetus to do that. Yeah. We shouldn't shouldn't belittle how far we've come, though. I mean, converting a uh, what was a, almost universally a death sentence into a sure. disease that's manageable by one pill a day. I'd think that's a huge, huge mm. success. Um, you know, having a cure. If if you you know if you think of this is where we were, and cure is up here. I'd right. say you know we're we're here. One pill a day is, I mean, I take one pill a day for a, a bunch of other conditions and uh, that's okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a price worth paying, yeah. Yeah. All right, that'll do it for Office Hours tonight. We'll be back next Wednesday. A number of people have asked me why I got the, um, the latest booster. I'll tell you next week. How about that, okay? I'll explain it all. Meanwhile, I want to thank our moderators, Vanity Nutrition, Tom Steinberg, Steph SF and uh, Les Fabi. Thank you all for being here tonight and uh, keeping everybody in line. Thanks to everyone who donated tonight. If you haven't and you'd like to, there's a super chat button there below. But you can also go over the Venmo. There's the address up there. And um, they take a little less of a tithe than uh, YouTube. So if you want to have more, come to Microbe TV. And this money goes to our production. We're we're growing, we're adding more programs, and we're adding more help. I was going to introduce to you tonight Kim, our latest addition to uh, the incubator. Uh, Kim is at uh, uh, at the incubator two, two days a week and is helping us out with all kinds of social media issues. If you've given at Patreon, for example, and you suddenly got a mug or a T-shirt, it's because Kim is filling all the back orders for that. So thanks to Kim and Karen for helping out. Uh, and um, thanks, everyone, for coming. We really appreciate it. And finally, Paul, Paul B. Nash, Rockefeller University. Thank you so much. It was a great conversation. I enjoyed it. <clears throat> well, thank you for having me. And thank you to your audience for the great questions. It was fun. Uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. It's a great audience. And um, you and Theodore will be on TWIV one of these days. We're, we're working on a time. I think you have a paper in right. preparation or something. When that gets further along, we'll have you over to talk about it. Great. Looking forward you, to it. Have you to the incubator. Okay, everybody. See you next week. Until then, be safe. Good night. <laughs>